Well, I've been looking forward to this for a while. Dr. Owen Strand is author of a book called Christianity and Wokeness. Now, we've talked about critical race theory, critical theory a number of times on NBL, but it's kind of a hard topic to wrap your brain around. And it seems to be that this idea of critical race theory and the woke gospel and stuff is seeping into evangelical churches. So we're going to talk about it because he's author of a book called Christianity and Wokeness, how the social justice movement is hijacking the gospel and the way to stop it. Now, uh, been a variety of people have read this book, said it's exceptional. Wayne Grudem is one of them. He's a distinguished research professor of theology and biblical studies. said this is an alarming and remarkably insightful book. There are other endorsements we'll talk about a little bit later. But um, first of all, let me welcome Dr. Strand to the conversation. And Owen, good to have you with us. How are you? I'm doing great, Neil. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Well, you're welcome, and we're grateful that you've taken time to join us. This stuff, you know, critical race theory, wokeness, I said to somebody the other day, um, we live in a woke society, that's why we have a woke Olympics. They said, well, what does that mean? It's, it's not common language for some people, so in the best layman's terms you can muster, help us understand what we're talking about here. Yeah, great question, and I just... Uh, a few minutes ago, drafted a piece called Woke Olympics. So you and I are definitely hey, thinking okay. <laughs> along similar lines. There you I go. I wrote that, wrote that phrase on Microsoft Word an hour ago. Wow. So, um, yeah, and by the way, we could talk about the Olympics. And right. Dispiriting there. Wokeness means being awake and becoming an activist to the nature of systemic racism and inequality in a society. So if you're woke, you formerly uh, thought that America, in this example, in this country, was a good place to be and just as a public order and had made racial progress. But when you go woke, you actually understand now uh, in a kind of secular conversion experience that actually America is shot through with racism. And the racism specifically that it bears is not direct and explicit racism. It's really invisible and hidden racism that manifests in microaggressions small behavioral decisions and actions that you may not even know you're perpetuating as a usually a white person. So this is really, um, it, it's, a, it's a serious ideology. It's influencing us in so many ways, but it's pretty bonkers at its root. It's, uh, it's claiming basically that everything is racism. And if everything is racism, then nothing is racism. Mm-hmm. Which begs the question, then what's the point? And maybe let me just go there first. We've got a ton to talk about, and we're going to dig into the content of the book. But if if everything is racism, then nothing is. And by the way, when you start identifying people and saying you're bad because you're white, isn't that, in fact, racism? It, it is totally racism. And that is what is so nuts about this system is it is totally a, a, an emperor wearing no clothes proposition, mm-hmm. emperor wearing no clothes system. Honestly, everybody is watching the emperor go by and lauding his beautiful clothing, when in reality, you know, he's, he's in the buff. And what is happening here is everybody is saying, oh, what a wonderful system, wokeness, critical race theory, intersectionality. It's so great that we have these systems because these are anti-racist, and this is going to make America just, and social justice will sweep us uh, like, like a wonderful wave and cleanse our national sin. In reality, this is real racism. This is new racism. This isn't yeah. the end of racism. This is racist centralism. This is the stuff we, we actually got over. We actually made progress uh, against in the last 40 to 50, 60 years in the West, in America, in Canada, in the U.K. We, we've made major progress along these lines. And weirdly, uh, Neil, wokeness is reversing all of that. Mm-hmm. And the American Academy, the Western Academy, corporations, businesses, entertainment, woke athletes are, are trumpeting this and saying it's a good thing. It's not a good thing. It's the reverse. Yeah. Um, which begs the question, how did it get so popular? But before we go on, let me just say this. Um, John MacArthur, who's heard here on this radio station and has been for 40-plus years, um, m- many of you are fans of Grace to You and John MacArthur. You've read his books. He said church leaders who would self-identify as gospel-centered seem to have shifted the actual focus of their message to social justice and to other themes borrowed from critical race theory's tapestry of pet issues. Now, I know that you're a provo and senior professor of theology at Grace Bible 
the, uh, Theological Seminary and a senior fellow with the Family Research Council. Um, you care deeply about this same kind of stuff, but let me ask a question. Like, how did, how did a bankrupt system become so popular? Why is it that everybody is just blindly following after this thing? And then we'll, you know, later begin to delve into how this is seeping even into the church. But what is it about this theory that supposedly works but actually does the opposite that seems so popular all of a sudden? Two major things. Really good branding. It says that it's for justice and against racism. So the branding snookers a lot of people. We're not really in an intellectual age. Uh, we don't really read things. We don't think deeply about things. We don't investigate claims and where they come from. We don't think in terms of systems. And so, again, the branding is really good. And then secondly, Americans fear nothing if not being called a racist. And so if, uh, if somebody whispers in your ear, hey, here, here's a way not to be a racist, uh, you, you will have people line up behind you like a Pied Piper. It is right to oppose racism. Racism is abhorrent. But you have to recognize not all systems are the same. Not all visions of justice are exactly the same. And so the reason tons of people have been led astray by critical race theory and wokeness is because in public schools, in corporations, in boardrooms, in HR training sessions, and so on, People are, are, are told, hey, everybody, the company is, is against racism, and we're bringing in an expert on diversity and justice who is going to help us make real progress along these lines. And then the lecturer shows up. Let's say it's Robin D'Angelo, a real, real person who, who does this, and she, she opens up you know, her PowerPoint, and what she then says is white people are white supremacists in so many words. That's what's happening. So she gets in the door by saying she's against racism, what she then perpetuates in her sessions, like Ibram X. Kendi and others, is neo-racism. But, but nobody bothers to do the homework and see if this is sound thinking. By the way, third factor, we're just in a leftist country now. The, the West is so susceptible to leftist thought, even though it's fully bankrupt in so many categories, uh, that we're soft targets. It's shocking stuff. Now, I was told by someone in the know uh, who worked for Heritage Foundation, works for Heritage Foundation, that critical race theory is really not new, that, that something called critical theory was being taught in universities decades ago, and it kind of morphed into, it, it was popular apparently in legal circles, but then began to morph into this thing we now call critical race theory. Do you have any handle on the history of how this came to be? Yeah, critical theory is associated with what is called the Frankfurt School, Gramsci, and others who sought to deconstruct basically traditional Western culture. They read religion as um, oppressive. They, they read traditional ethics and morals as oppressive. And so they sought through fancy language and academic speak and books that almost nobody could even understand, including themselves, uh, to deconstruct the Western order, deconstruct anything approaching a Christian ethic, a Christian worldview, or even just a traditional worldview. And they were very successful in destabilizing uh, European intellectual circles in the mid-20th century. And yes, critical race theorists have built off of that. They have, they have especially um, bought the idea that the West is driven by power dynamics. That's really the, the connection between the two systems. And it's all ultimately built off of Marx, who argued that uh, Western society was built off of faulty power dynamics, uh, the rich oppressing the poor in the most simplified form. The critical theorist said the, the, the traditionalists oppress the unusual, the, the minorities to the culture, the weird, uh, the sexually outside the margins. And critical race theorists now argue in similar terms that the white oppress uh, the people of color. So all through those systems, the, the plumb line is that of oppressor and oppressed. Uh, there is a dominant power group oppressing somebody and not doing so in, in a white supremacist or Jim Crow kind of way, but simply by virtue of existing, simply by virtue of being part of uh, this, this majority culture called whiteness. White people oppress people of color, whether you want to or not, whether you're aware of it or not. You are an oppressor by virtue of belonging to that, that power block. 
Okay, now, I don't believe that. I don't accept that. And I think a lot of people listening don't believe or accept that. But clearly, there have been white people throughout human history who have oppressed people of color or people unlike themselves, you know, in terms of their ethnic origin or whatever. So, I mean, in the same way, we might say racism is real and racism exists, but is every white person a racist? Uh, I think not. So help us understand how we, uh, how we navigate the nuances of what we're talking about here, because the other thing is that not everyone, I mean, there's an awful lot of people that are against racism, me for one, and I'm sure you are as well, but but I'm not woke. I hope I'm not woke. Uh, so there right. are there are some nuances we need to navigate. So everybody under so people understand that we're uh, painting everything with a broad brush here. Yeah. Well, fundamentally, Marxism has set up the board, uh, and so if you buy the terms of wokeness, then you are letting wokeness win. Mm-hmm. So what we do is we don't play the board the way. Uh, uh, wokeness has set it up. Yes, of course we, we know from Scripture, from the Word of God, uh, from the Bible, that racism is wrong. Partiality of any kind is wrong. James 2.1, show no partiality, James says, for example, to Christians in the first century. So uh, that's a foundation for us to say we're not supposed to treat anyone better than anyone else in, in a sinful way, in a, in, a, in a wrongly preferential way. And, and so that's that's what we condemn. We don't have to go to wokeness for that. We don't go to critical race theory for that as, as Christians. Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't go to any other system for, for our foundational thought. There are kernels of truth in other systems. Yes, you'll bump up against the truth in other systems to varying degrees. But fundamentally, uh, uh, we, we oppose racism not because of Marx or not because of uh, Richard Delgado and critical race theorists, but because that's what God has taught us is wrong. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, if you start there, now you're able to start making sense of things, and you haven't started playing the board per woke- wokeness's terms. And I don't want to overstate this, but then it would seem to be that if we're really beginning to buy into this in evangelical circles, sadly and alarmingly, <laughs> then what yep. we're really kind of saying is we're, we need Karl Marx to help us interpret Scripture. Yeah, and that's fundamentally, to bring in another stream of thought that's in the mixture, what black liberation theology argued, for example. James Cone gave us this term. He said, Marxism is a tool of social analysis that helps us deconstruct and understand Western culture. I'm paraphrasing, but that term was exact, a tool of social analysis, because capitalism poisoned Western society, so what you need is you need Marxism to understand the oppressor-oppressed power dynamic. Cohn and others who are saying that are completely wrong. That is totally wrong. You don't need Marxism for anything uh, except to round out your wastebasket. Uh, what you need <laughs> is a biblical worldview. A biblical worldview rightly understands oppression. Of course, of course sinful rulers can get elected or can take power in a society and, and then make sin public. We know that. We have abortion on the books in America, for mm-hmm. example. We know sin can go public, but that is not at all the same thing as looking to any ideology for our foundational ethics or morals. Our guest is Dr. Owen Strand. I want to spell his last name, and I hope I get this right, S-T-R-A-C-H. A N, so it's kind of like you drop the C H when you pronounce it. Dr. Owen Strand, S T R A C H A N, and the book is called Christianity and Wokeness. Uh, I'm not exactly sure when it came out, but I believe this is just released, right? Recently, yes. it okay. just dropped last week, and my last name is a Scottish last name. I'll just slip that in there. Scottish Highlands, baby. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah. Well, how cool to be able to have you on the air, and of course, uh, I also mentioned earlier that. Dr. Strand is a research professor of theology at Grace Bible Theological Seminary and a senior fellow with the Family Research Council. Uh, grateful to have him with us today. It's a, it's a highly acclaimed book that I urge you to get your hands on. We're going to dig in a whole lot deeper, but we've got to take a quick break. We'll be back in a moment. By the way, I assume this is available at Amazon and wherever books are sold? That's exactly right. It's been in the top 100 on Amazon most of the last week. It's a really exciting deal. Phenomenal. Okay. Christianity and Wokeness from Owen Strand. And we're going to continue the conversation. More to come here on NBL. So uh, call a friend. Tell him to listen in. We'll be back with more right after this. 
All right, let's get back to it. And Dr. Owen Strand, our guest, Christianity and Wokeness. We, we I think, done an adequate job here. Uh, hopefully I've asked the right questions. You've done an incredible job describing what critical race theory is and wokeness and, and what these terms actually mean. But one more, real quick. Intersectionality, you threw that out there. That's a term that gets tossed around once in a while. What does that mean? Uh, that's another great question. Intersectionality basically points to minority groups of varying kinds, whether economic minorities, racial minorities, uh, weight minorities, sexual minorities. And it says all of you guys in these minority positions, y- you have been oppressed by the majority position, and your interests intersect. So you guys who are in the minority, you can, you can find common cause uh, because your your minority positions intersect, and if you're a if you're a person who has multiple uh, identity connections to those minority groups, then you're a person who should especially be listened to and platformed in society. Intersectionality is really the the on the ground uh, uh, action plan of wokeness, and it's it's equally fascinating and wild. It's just a wild powder keg. Of, uh, of an idea. It basically says things like, uh, okay, splitting the world up into majority and minority group in tons of categories, we can do this, for example, with weight. So fat people have been oppressed by thin people, because if you look at magazine covers and athletes on TV and celebrities, uh, thinness is normalized. Mm-hmm. So since critical theory has taught us that that which is normalized oppresses that which is not normalized, Fat people have been oppressed automatically and are oppressed in Western society. So there's an actual discipline called, for example, fat studies. My comments here are not against any one group, but I I am simply trying to express how um, truly inventive and revolutionary this system is. It takes that which is not the, the normal position for any number of reasons, and it weaponizes it, it politicizes it, and it launches it as a noble cause when it may very well be no such thing. I don't know what lit the fuse on this, but it seems to be really connected to the George Floyd thing. And what I'm getting at is that there was a lot happening behind the scenes, but a powder keg set it off uh, when George Floyd uh, yep. died. And so all of us, because I, I heard Christians saying, well, well, we're not for that. We saw... Derek Chauvin, you know, on his neck, and and, and he died. He, we really believe he was killed. We're not, Christians are not for that. Jesus wouldn't be for that. And I agree, Jesus wouldn't be for that. But uh, at the same time, all of a sudden, people started posting Black Lives Matter stuff everywhere it, without really knowing what Black Lives Matter ultimately was about. And, uh, and this idea of wokeness, all of a sudden, it wasn't just like, hey, this might be a good idea to have in our churches. I actually heard people say... Like, you're not Christian unless you have it in your church. That it became part and parcel with the gospel. And it's clearly not, and I believe it's dangerous, but help us understand why it's so problematic that churches are accepting or even promoting this kind of ideology. Revolutions are always in search of what will light the match. And that is what happened a year ago with George Floyd. There were obviously um, complex circumstances in his death, there appears to be drug use. Um, there's conflicting accounts of, you know, the officer on the neck and these sorts of things. Right. But suffice it to say, uh, there was no evidence of any racism on Chauvin's part that anyone uncovered. There was no sign that, that Chauvin had targeted Floyd to kill him for his blackness. Uh, there, it is still debated to this day uh, whether Chauvin acted in the right way to subdue Floyd. I tend to think that Floyd was already in severe distress before uh, Chauvin took the Mm -hmm. common action. But anyway, the point broader in a cultural and societal way is that nobody really cared about the details of Floyd. Nobody waited to hear about the facts on the ground. Um, That that was an example of a revolution in search uh, of of a flame. And, uh, And Floyd's death, for various reasons, sparked it and sparked Black Lives Matter, and Antifa joined in. And basically, America burned a summer ago with basically no retribution, no just response in so many cities and places in this country. And it was terrible. It was awful. Uh, it was not a just movement. 
Um, it is appropriate to hold police to account. Uh, we all want that. Christians want that. We don't think Christians are perfect. Uh, we don't think police members are perfect by any stretch. Uh, we all are sinners who need Christ. But um, to torch the American public order and to throw bricks through glass and destroy minority businesses, and in St. Louis, for example, to kill a former African-American police chief, that is not at all social justice. And uh, that is the opposite of justice. And tragically, many Christians got on the bandwagon very quickly. We're in a, we're in a, uh, a movement today. We're in a time when if you don't instantaneously signal that you are on the right side of history, you're on the wrong side of history. And, uh, and that's a tragic outcome because the right side of history is very frequently not where public opinion is. Um, it is, it is the right side of history is wherever God is wherever the Word of God is, wherever Christ is, that is the right side of history. And in handling complex matters like police shootings, people dying at the hands of police, we can all know that there are going to be complex circumstances. It is going to be very wise to obey James 1 and be slow to speak and slow to anger, but that is not the calibration of our culture generally, and certainly that was not the calibration of Black Lives Matter and Antifa, who were, at least in a good number of cases, looking for an excuse to burn America down, believing, uh, if you look at their founding documents, that America is an unjust order. It has been since its founding. This is part of what uh, related uh, ideas and ideologies, like the 1619 Project, now discredited, argue that America was racist at its founding. It is still racist today. And so we need to we need to rebuild this order. And if that involves violence and bloodshed, well, shrug your shoulders. Wow. So, what happens though if uh, if Christians start to believe and I guess embrace the reality or the idea I should say idea that the church is inherently racist, that the church is really about this kind of thing and has been forever? Because I mean, there was a time when people would go to church in the South and worship God and then go home and and look look after their slaves again like and so they would look sure. at that and say well look at what we did we we surely want to be against that kind of thing so we need to be about wokeness we need to be about critical race theory because it's against these things uh what happens if, yeah. if the church embraces this stuff what happens is that the church is going to be taken captive by godless ideology by secular sociology and not by uh sound doctrine so colossians 2 8 is tragically going to play out with the Church being taken captive by godless ideologies like wokeness, by uh, unsound movements like critical race theory. Uh, Christians should not march with Black Lives Matter. Every life uh, is, is made by God. Every person is an image-bearer, uh, Genesis 1, 26-28. So we have a, a rich foundation as Christians, biblically, for human dignity. But we need to recognize that we can say two things. We can say first, uh, that racism is wrong and is found in the American past, and we're so glad it, it's been substantially overcome in, in public form. And secondly, we can say that the way forward against racism, for we're all as Christians against racism, is in no way to partner with godless movements like BLM and Antifa. Mm -hmm. That is the opposite. That's going to take us the opposite direction. That's not heading away from the cliff. That is driving at 120 miles an hour toward the cliff. And, uh, and Christians who try to marry um, wokeness, critical race theory, BLM, uh, and related movements with the gospel are driving toward the cliff at top speed. And that's why my book, Christianity and Wokeness, uh, aims to be a voice in the wilderness, because it seems like almost nobody wants to call these things out and call a spade a spade. But, um, you know... I'm no great shakes, but <laughs> I am resolved to stand with my Lord and Master, Jesus Christ, as, uh, as best I can, and I am resolved to try to help the Church not be taken captive, as it is. It is being taken captive today in different forms. So let me see if I can say this using my own words, and tell me if I'm on the right track, because I want to make sure that I'm fully grasping what sure. you're saying. I think a lot of people are really intrigued by what you're saying, but want to make sure we get this right. If... It, <clears throat> I'm against racism. The people I hang out with are against racism. We we know it's real. It does still happen. Not right. the way that it used to, but and there's been tremendous progress. I agree with you on that. But there, there still is racist 
attitudes in, in the hearts and minds of some people. Of course. And the gospel of Jesus Christ, the word of God addresses those things, so let's agree on that point. But, but the right. idea here of saying, well, look, because we're against racism, then we should embrace Black Lives Matter means you're actually inviting a real problem into your midst, into your church, because when you begin to say, uh, because we can partner on the idea that we're against racism, we're forgetting that many of these movements are against God. Like, okay, we can agree that racism's bad, so maybe we can feel like there's common ground there, but there's no common ground spiritually with people who don't believe in God or the truth of his word, because those, those movements aren't founded on the truth of Scripture, they're founded on human ideology. I don't know what your thoughts are about that. Or, yeah, um, that's excuse me. That that's exactly it, Neil. Um, we as Christians, and I, I have two chapters on the biblical teaching on unity and identity as human people. Okay, the Scripture has literally everything we need to find everlasting unity. Okay, that's how strong our claim is as Christians. Our claim is not that we can find temporary unity in this world and get along better with our neighbor who has 2.2 children and a Highlander in the driveway. Our claim as believers is that we have everlasting unity, eternal unity in Christ through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, through saving faith that God gives us. So when we become a Christian, um, we're not casting about to try to be unified with people. We are one family with everybody who is also forgiven through God's grace in Christ. The Church is God's solution, God's plan for unity. God's plan for unity is not some public square structuralist socialist solution. Uh, the Gospel impinges on the public square. It has things, the Bible has lots of things to say about politics, but our solution for unity is not going to be found in Black Lives Matter. Our solution for unity in this world is not going to be found in the Democratic Party. Our solution for unity in this world is definitely not going to be found in wokeness. It's not going to be found in any system, frankly, outside of the gospel of grace. So that's, that's a huge part of what we have to say here. Mm -hmm. If you want to help people be against racism, the absolute best thing you can do would be to turn them onto the Word of God, not to, not to indoctrinate them in, in Black Lives Matter or Antifa, or Marxism, or critical race theory, that will actually subtly, though they may not realize it, those systems will actually train them into a new form of racism. The, the former form was against black people, people of color, in different ways, right? right? The new form is to be against white people. And the solution for sinful partiality is not more sinful partiality. Our grandmother taught us that when we were six. Mm -hmm. Two runs do not make a right. Wow. You nailed that. Um, okay, so we know what a whole lot more about what we shouldn't do. I'd love to talk about what we can do and should do um, to address these things in a biblical way. Uh, can you hang on for one more segment? Are you good with that? Of course, yeah. I All got right. it. The book is called Christianity and Wokeness, Owen Strand, Dr. Owen Strand, spelled S-T-R-A-C-H-A-N. Dr. Owen Strand is our guest. And he's got an awful lot to say about a very important issue that if you haven't run into it yet, you will soon. You're going to run into it in your, in your schools, in your neighborhood, uh, on the local auxiliary club or the Little League uh, you know, board of directors. You're going to run into this stuff sooner or later, so be prepared. And as believers, we need to know what the Word of God says about this. So I highly recommend the book Christianity and Wokeness from Dr. Owen Strand. It's available at Amazon and wherever books are sold including Cornerstone Bookshop in North York, Ontario. Ask them to order you some copies so that you can pick them up when you get to the store, and they will for sure not be sold out because they'll be holding your copy for you. By the way, let me just ask you before the break, uh, Owen, if you don't mind, um, your involvement with the Family Research Council, we obviously have done many interviews with them, and years ago I actually worked at the Family Research Council, but um, you're a fellow there, so uh, do you primarily write for them and speak on behalf of the Family Research Council? Yeah, appreciate it. I'm a senior fellow for FRC, and I'm specifically in the Center for Biblical Worldview, which they recently began. Gotcha. So uh, I do writing for them, speaking for them, media, and uh, generally partner and strategize in global, conservative, Christian-influenced world domination. 
Love it. All right. Well, Vody Bakum Jr., Dean of the School of Divinity of African Christian uh, University at African Christian University, an author of Fault Line, said Owen Strand, uh, Strand has done a great service to the body and to the church by not only taking aim at one of her most dangerous foes, that being wokeness, but also by pointing her again and again to her all-sufficient Savior and head. And of course, we know that's Jesus. We'll be back in just a moment with Dr. Owen Strand here on NBL. The book is called Christianity and Wokeness, and there's more to come right after this. Don't go away. All right, let's get back to it, and what an honor to have Dr. Owen Strand with us. Christianity and Wokeness, brand new right here in July, and you want to get a copy as soon as you possibly can because this is talking about some of the things we've addressed here that are really pretty hard to wrap your brain around. And I don't know, <laughs> when you know, in a practical sense, when you were writing this, if you had to keep reminding yourself of what all of these terms mean because... They've all come on like a flood in just the last couple of years, and all of a sudden we're dealing with issues that we never actually had to grapple with before. So I don't know how you keep it straight, but you're doing a great job describing it. Well, thank you. The, the terms are really where the battle lies, too, Neil. That's a, that's a really important point you're making, because equity, justice, fairness, diversity, tolerance, these things have just been uh, shot at us like machine gun bullets over the last five to ten years in different forms, and most of us have no idea what the terms mean, and frankly, the other side, the woke side, doesn't tell you usually. It it doesn't really show its hand, and that's part of what I think is some of the satanic influence of this movement, if you go all the way down to the core. Not everybody knows that or or is directly channeling that, but if you go all the way down, um, Satan wants things disguised and concealed. He, he, wants, he presents himself as an angel of light mm-hmm. to the Church. And if we talk about that in the broader public square, I think it applies, because we're, we're not going to know what's hitting us. Tons of people listening to you and me right now uh, across, across the region don't know what our culture or society means when it says equity, for example, or social justice. But that's part of what I'm trying to do in this book, in Christianity and Wokeness. I have a glossary at the end that hopefully folks can use, because we, we as Christians, part of what we do in responding um, uh, to our world is not just shout the gospel. We do that, but we actually define things, systematize them, understand them, and then we respond mm-hmm. to the ungodly system. You know, whoever controls the terms controls the language. It's almost like uh, in the abortion yeah. issue that you mentioned earlier, pro-choice sounds so wonderful. Everybody's for choice, right? I mean, and we're pro-choice. Yeah. And so the media has long labeled Christians who don't believe in abortion as anti-abortion. Just think of the difference in the way those terms. And then, of course, Planned Parenthood just sounds wonderful. It sounds like a warm-hearted organization who just happens to be America's number one abortion provider. Um, So let me just throw a term at you real quick, and then we'll talk about biblical pursuit of justice. But um, equity, you threw that term out. Now, all men are created equal. You know, that our founding fathers had a lot to say about that. God, you referred to in Scripture, you know, says there's no partiality, neither Jew yeah. nor Greek, slave or free. Christ died once for all mankind, you know, the, the just for the unjust, nor that he might bring us to God. Uh, so God's clear about the issue of uh, equality, but equity is a different thing entirely. That's literally, I think, where the idea, idea came that every kid who participates or shows up at a at a baseball field ought to get a trophy or yes. yeah or that you know people would complain well look at I, i've been working here for five years and i don't get to go play golf but it turns out maybe you're you never went to college and you're the receptionist whereas the guy who gets to go play golf is the senior sales manager who's been working for 45 years for the company and has gained the right to be able to play golf with clients. But that, but see, that I mean, that's a very practical example I'm giving, but the point is equity is a major issue right now, and equity implies everybody ought to get everything equally. Um, yep. And that's I don't think that's a biblical concept. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, it's hilarious because we are so often lectured by celebrity athletes, for example. We're getting a lot of lecturing right now through the woke Tokyo Olympics, as we talked about earlier. Mm-hmm. And you got somebody who is worth roughly a cool billion, like LeBron James, who had a rough childhood, admittedly, right. but has, has, through a variety of circumstances, been able to become this fabulously successful man in this country, in America. Uh, and you recognize him saying that America is unequal for a person like him? just doesn't make sense. 
But what leftists mean, what woke people mean when they're talking about equity is, is exactly what you said, that everybody basically should have the same, uh, same life, same conditions of living, same money, same opportunity. What we as Christians are about, if I can use the terminology of conservative economist Thomas Sowell, is not about equality of outcome. We know that not everybody's going to have the same outcome. Uh, it, it is, we, we know that um, I was not um, discriminated against uh, because I didn't end up in the NBA. I have no right, I have no claim to play basketball in the NBA. I grew up in Maine, wanted to be a Celtic. Uh, didn't happen, suffice mm-hmm. it to say, okay? Mm-hmm. I'm out here writing books. But um, LeBron James's logic would say it is wrong of society to keep me from having his same station, his same position. But we know, as Christians and as those who want to think logically, that's crazy. Equality doesn't mean equality of outcome. It doesn't mean that everybody ends up a billionaire. It means that we have a quality of opportunity, and that's what we want in America. That's always a pursuit. It, it's not something that we have achieved perfectly in this country. But frankly, our educational system, the free market, uh, a strong influence from churches, all those things, an emphasis on the family over the, over the centuries, all those things help people get more and more opportunities such that they can lead a prosperous, happy, uh, thriving life. Um, That's what we're after then as Christians. We're after equality of opportunity because no one can guarantee what socialism says it it can deliver, equality of outcome. It can't deliver that. Everywhere socialism and Marxism is tried, it ends up so frequently with, with things burning, you know, images of destruction and violent revolution and millions of people dying in the revolution. So fuzzy leftist ideas have tragic consequences, and we need to avoid our culture's definition of equity and embrace a biblical understanding of equality. So how do we... Well, here's a simple question. If How would you know if your church was going woke? Like, all of a sudden, if, if the church began to care more about these type of things than about preaching the true gospel of Jesus Christ and, and the truth of his word, would it be evident? Yeah. True Christians, you mentioned MacArthur earlier, true Christians know when they're getting, you know, secular sociology from the pulpit. When you're getting up, upbraided for being white, your white privilege, your white fragility, um, if, if, the, if the pastor's really gone woke, you're hearing about white supremacy. When you're hearing those kind of concepts, when, when every third sermon is about systemic racism, when every fifth sermon is about solving inequality, Suffice it to say, you're hearing wokeness talking. And so my encouragement in all sincerity to your listeners would be, if you are, if you are hearing wokeness from the pulpit, set up an appointment with your pastor, with your elders, whatever it may be, graciously try to help them see that this is unsound and unbiblical. And then if they're not going to repent, frankly, and they're not going to turn away, and they're going to be a weak and compromising man, then it is time to find a new church, because life is too short to sit under unsound doctrine. Find you a strong Bible-preaching church where you are not going to be lectured uh, for your skin color, whatever it may be, where you're not going to be trained per our culture to despise one another for your skin color. Find a place that's actually going to celebrate the unity that is in Christ, the unity that brings people from every background together. Find a church like that. Is social justice itself wrong, or is it that we overemphasize ideas that fall under so i mean because clearly god cares about the poor he cares about the weak and i think we should too Uh, even if you look at the story of the good samaritan which i might argue is really actually more about us being the one in need of jesus who stopped to minister to us you know you could make that case too that that we're the one in need of, of help but the point is um you know we learn from stories like that that god cares about such things so is social justice itself bad, or the emphasis we're putting on it? Well, um, again, the system matters so much. What mm-hmm. are the roots of social justice? Lots of people use the term, right? So not everybody who uses the term social justice knows those roots and means everything that um, the originators intended. But basically, if you contrast social justice with biblical justice, you recognize that social justice uh, per woke categories, per critical race theory, per intersectionality especially, means dynamiting our society 
and lifting up oppressed peoples, like we were talking about earlier with those intersectional categories. So, for example, LGBT-identifying people are sexual minorities. Social justice uh, means that you are going to um, uh, relieve that condition of oppression for sexual minorities, and you're going to normalize them, and you're, you're going to give them societal power. That is exactly what is playing out, by the way, when some athlete, it's usually an athlete, um, according to the media's breathless reporting, comes out as gay or lesbian. That is the media not necessarily spelling it all out and telling you what they're doing. That is the media righting the wrong through social justice of former oppression of that sexual minority. And what we need to say as Christians is, yes, somebody of, of any kind of background uh, could be wrongly treated and hated, and, and that's not right as a, as a Christian. We don't hate LGBT people at, at all, but it is not at all wrong to teach that homosexuality is sinful and invites God's dread judgment and is condemned in no uncertain terms in Romans 1, 18-32. So, so a part of our love for people who are attracted to the same sex is to call them out of that and to call them to the light of Jesus Christ. And so social justice is affirming them and telling them they are this uh, they are this group that needs platforming, and we are telling them, no, flee the judgment of God that is against every sinner, including me. Uh, so social justice's aims are, are totally contrary, I argue, to the Word of God, and it's biblical justice. I want to throw a question at you from left, left field that I've been thinking about for a while, and I can't really clearly identify an answer except maybe Ephesians 6.12, uh, which is the one that says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Here's the question. How is it that some, I'll just call them minority groups, you referred to some earlier, like the LGBT, especially the transgender community right now? Um, I mean, I think I've known one person personally, but known of two or three in my entire lifetime that had anything to do with transgenderism, and yet I've known tens of thousands of people that I've shaken hands with and gotten to know over the years. I'm, I'm an old guy. I've been around the block a couple times. So what I'm getting at is if, if I walked into a place and I said, hey, look, at uh, the, the way that you know, the community here is treating Christians is improper. We, we try to have a, a Christian march uh, on the street, or we want to have a Christian festival in the park, and we're not being given permits, or we're being persecuted against. You all need to treat us better because, you know, religious freedom is real and so forth. The people on the board might just roll their eyes and go, yeah, we'll, we'll take a seat in the back and we'll get to you later. Like, But if you walk in and say that you're transgender, all of a sudden everybody drops everything, and right. whole systems change, whole procedures change instantly because somebody makes an announcement like that. Where's the power coming from? How, they don't have the numbers to win in, in, in some kind of a, a vote. Like if the American people said, you know, do you think everybody should agree to teaching, you know, ch- kindergartners about transgenderism? Should we gender fluidity and stuff? Should that be allowed in schools? They'd never win by a popular vote. So where's the power coming from? The whole thing is a con, Neil. The whole thing is one big, long con. Uh, we are told that uh, we are oppressing people. Uh, if we hold to a biblical sexual ethic, when in reality, we are the ones who are being marginalized. We are the ones who, who are being effectively uh, opposed, and perhaps even you could say oppressed mm-hmm. in this country at some level. So um, it, it, it's very similar to the earlier categories we were talking about, where uh, the, the minority group is said to be the marginalized group, but in reality, because of the leftist shift, the, the godless shift in our culture, actually, those are so often the people who have all the power mm-hmm. and all the influence and get the platform and get the megaphone and get their stories told and have the media support them. And to be a Christian, as you, as you said, is in many cases to have very little agency. I mean, uh, not to get us into too many different conversations here, but probably pretty soon conversations like this are going to be labeled misinformation or disinformation, depending on whether you like M or D better. Uh, And that's going to mean that um, this sort of discussion is going to be anathema, and and probably, I would guess, if trends continue in America anyway, is going to be outlawed. Mm -hmm. And and so you just just think about the fact that um, we are the ones who are being said to oppress others. 
when we this is a con, we are being oppressed. We are being opposed. We are being discriminated against. That's how America is working today. Right is wrong. Evil is called good. Good is called evil. The only real note of encouragement we can find in all of this is that the people of God have been here before. This isn't new. You can go to the Old Testament 3,000 years ago, 2,500 years ago, and this is what was happening to true followers of God. Up was down, down was up, and through it all, God is our stability. Literally, the Scripture tells us that in, in, in a verse in Isaiah. God is the stability of our times. Mm-hmm. The stability of our times is not us, it's not even, it's not even our local church, it's not even our dad or mom, important as these things are, uh, it's not our loved ones, it is ultimately the stability of our time is the Lord, and the Lord alone. Well, you got to get a copy of this book, Christianity and Wokeness. You're going to learn how to respond to racism and today's social unrest in a, a biblical and gospel-centered way. It's a book that describes a lot of the terminology, but then helps us understand what God's Word says. God is against racism, but much of what we're adopting and uh, embracing in the church today that's beginning to seep in or is already made its way into the church, uh, is actually anti-God. It's anti-Scripture, and nobody that I've talked to yet has pointed that out in a more interesting or clear fashion than Dr. Owen Strand. I want to ask you to, you know, obviously we want people to get a copy of the book, get it at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, wherever books are sold, including Cornerstone Bookshop in North York, Ontario. Yeah, we actually still have a real bookstore on the air. Can you believe that? Love it. Yeah. Love it. Old school, and they're hanging in there. They're doing great. Um, God but, bless them. Yeah, so, but leave us with a word of encouragement, because Jesus Christ is the victorious risen Lord. Our hope is in Him, and one day there's going to be a world where there's no pain, no suffering, no tears, when uh, the new heaven and the new earth become reality to us. In the meantime, we're to stand for truth and righteousness, so help us um, help us embrace a, a positive view of, of how we can address these things as we move forward. Yeah, I mean, that God-centered perspective that we were just talking about is a massive part of it. Uh, Don't find your comfort in this world. Don't find your identity in this world. Don't find your stability in this world. Find it in God. The the tragedy is the days are evil, and uh, and things are shaking out. But if we'll find our confidence in God and in Christ, our Savior, then we will be unshakable, not by our own strength, but by God's strength. Um, so, so anchor yourself in the Word of God. Anchor yourself in a strong local church that preaches the Word. Um, know the truth. Know the evil ideologies that are coming at you. That's what this book is about, equipping Christians to, to, to know sound doctrine and to be able to contradict those who refute it, Titus 1.9. And so if you can have that kind of mindset, uh, you're already a good ways down the track where you need to be. Well, listen, uh, I would love to get you back sometime. I know you've written somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 books, and this latest Christianity and Wokeness is brand new, but I'd love to get you back when we can take some live calls and talk further. But thank you for taking so much time to be with us. I feel encouraged and enlightened and uh, and challenged, you know, to, to, mm. to focus on this more often, even in the conversations we're having here on air. There's just too much at stake, and I appreciate the time you've taken to help point that out. Man, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you for having me, Neil. Appreciate right. you. God bless you. Dr. Owen Strand, S-T-R-A-C-H-A-N. We'll be back with more of NBL in just a moment here on WDCX. Get a copy of the book at a Christian bookstore near you or at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, wherever books are sold.